those who face eternity easily forget what a lifetime means, what an ending means. You know it doesn't have to be this way. No, Kunavai, it does. They need me. Welcome, welcome to End of Dragons Daily 81. Not too much preamble today, really, so we'll just get into the questions and answers real fast. There's no concept art to run through. There's been no news. Uh, well, there was Dragon Bash that got added, but that's not really End of Dragons related, so kind of arena nets, uh, balls in Arena Nets Court on this one. I did, however, do my greatest in Guild Wars 2 moments video, and there's a couple of questions in there, which I've decided to roll in today. Not strictly End of Dragons, but I think interesting about the future of the game and so on, nonetheless. So let's jump in. Oh, also, I didn't actually get through all the messages last time, which is uh, always a lovely problem to have. So let's run through a couple of those as well. First, we've got Terrafast, who is talking about the idea of where does the story go after End of Dragons? Uh, they say, I definitely think we could have the story after End of Dragons be that we discover Aureen is more of a stopgap measure and the world will still unravel just more slowly. We then have to explore the far corners of the world to track down these candidate beings that will be able to take part in a ritual that will create a new balance. This would play off of the Cycle is Reborn concept, and each future season slash expansion pack can be about the quest to find the new candidate. Yeah, it, that tagline to the expansion is, is such a weird one to me. The Cycle is Reborn, because... The rebirth of a cycle suggests that we're not really going to be breaking the cycle at all. We're just looping back around, you know, we're replacing six dragons with another six dragons, but the cycle is in place. The cycle is reborn. It's the same thing. It's still a cycle. It's not the cycle is broken or, you know, like the Game of Thrones, the wheel is broken, blah, blah, blah. But then, quite magically, they've paired that with the, the main title of the expansion is End of Dragons, which suggests the opposite. So there's, there's kind of dance that's going on between these two, which I, I really enjoy and creates a lot of mystery and head scratchiness about what the hell the devs are actually doing. And then, of course, where the story goes afterwards is going to play out of that. Again, though, I do want to re-emphasize, I love this idea that we don't have just a hard break from everything Elder Dragons related. Uh, we've had a bit of back and forth about this, and I acknowledge it's kind of superficial of me. I'll say on one hand that it's called Guild Wars, and it's not about guilds, but that's fine, it's just a title. And on the other hand, I'll look at the fact that all the branding for Guild Wars 2 has been about dragons, and you know, the two dragon logo, dragons, 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 what is Guild Wars 2 without dragons, it's just really weird to me, and I can't get my head around it. So the idea that the next living world, the next expansion maybe even after that, and then the, the living world after that, is still the fallout of the dragons, even though the dragons are gone, it's still kind of dragon oriented, that would mean a lot to me. As superficial as that is, and as illogical as that is, you know, I'm not being consistent with my opinions there, I, I, I think I do like this. The whole idea of the candidates, I'm a little bit more iffy on just because, you know, I feel like we, we've we been in that story since Living World Season 3. I think, to tell you the truth, it was only in Path of Fire that it was properly confirmed that was the idea. You know, that was Glent's full legacy. But Season 3 was really where we started focusing a lot on the egg and the birth of Aurene and stuff. So I feel like... If the Elder Dragon story feels played out and old and boring to people, which again is just the fault of the way the studio delivered it in my opinion, then surely the candidate replacement story also is by this point. Maybe maybe we should be throwing both of them out. I don't want to like have this thing where Guild Wars tries to do a big break in what its story's about and, and then retains certain elements, but it retains all the stuff people are bored of. That would be a bit lame. You know, I think uh, one thing that Guild Wars really needs is to be a little bit more unpredictable and dynamic feeling in how its story de develops. Uh, if I've learned one thing from Final Fantasy XIV, as I'm still continuing to play that, I know many of you guys are asking about it still, and I'm not sure whether I've mentioned this on End of Dragons Daily, I think I only did it on a stream. I think that that game's really good at holding in one hand a ton of story threads all at once, and it's very confident in not dropping them. And what that means is that we as the the player, as, as the person going through the story, it's really hard to tell where they're going. It all seems valid. It all seems really interesting. And then when eventually it does go in one of those directions, you know, that that's uniquely surprising in some way. You know, with Final Fantasy XIV, you have the Garlean Empire. You've got the stuff with the Asians. You have the primal threat, the dragon issue. And they weave in, you know, various character arcs as they're going along with it. Uh, by the way, I'm only really at the start of the first expansion right now. 
you can probably get a sense of that from the, the plot lines I just listed out there. But that's all quite captivating. And with Guild Wars, it does tend to feel a bit like... Okay, really, we're dealing with the Elder Dragons. And yeah, Balthazar's here, but he feels like a little bit of a diversion. Maybe too much so. You know, you never really expected Balthazar to survive Path of Fire and the story to suddenly fundamentally change in any way. I mean, from my perspective, I never expected that. Maybe following the story more casually, you would. But if you're following the story more casually, you don't care about where it, where it's falling apart a bit. So, yeah, to return to the, the comment, if we just go to this idea of replacing dragons, don't we stay in that issue? I kind of want to want the world to feel a bit more dynamic and where it goes and that comes out of having more interesting characters more interesting societies and not this overall meta arc that might have actually done more harm than good in the end which is weird to think of because i've always been an advocate of that kind of storytelling next because you know it gives you a sense of direction another comment from before uh rayon said would it be possible for us to visit zotaka at the end of living world season five or a new expansion i recently learned about their plans for utopia and I'd love to see it replicated in Guild Wars 2. You know, for years and years and years, I would have said no. In fact, you pro can probably find Q&A videos or, or streams or anything where I would have said no about this. But the truth is that very, very recently, the new art book came out. And in that art book, they're talking about Utopia lore as though it's like real and canon and still a part of this franchise. And I can't remember who the, the dev was or the writer was. But they basically said, the only true canon is the canon in the game. That's many years old, that quote now. I still kind of stand by that. I hope that the studio stands by that. Um, in which case, you know, even though they've recently said in an art book that all this stuff was, like, real, uh, maybe it's still not. Uh, but I do think Zoteca is, is a little bit more possible now. And what I just mentioned, you know, completely breaking away from kind of this one story idea. Maybe if we're holding many in our hands as we go forwards, one of them can be about Zoteca. And, and that can be, you know, a diversion worth of an entire expansion. There's kind of another side of it, too. Where the idea of it being the very next expansion bothers me a little bit. Because I really think Guild Wars 2 should, should always have been doing more than just going to Guild Wars 1 stuff. You know, as much as I want to see Guild Wars 1 mysteries and plot lines that they establish be paid off on. Especially the Eye of the North stuff. Because, you know, that, that's really what the second game was supposed to be about. As much as I want that, when I look at more distant places where really they didn't have to be involved in recent stories, like Cantha, like even Alona to a certain extent, you know, the, these places only got like one paragraph of information in the movement of the world. I kind of scratch my head to a certain degree and I'm like, did we really need to go there? Wouldn't it have been nice maybe if instead of a Maguma Jungle expansion, we had had a Blaze Ridge Mountains expansion? We hadn't gone east. Uh, sorry, west to a place where we'd seen in the first game. We went east. It was totally new. And I've met, I've pointed out as well that in several places in Guild Wars 2, we have gone to totally new places like the Sand Subtiles. I get that. But on like a big budgeted expansion scale, there's something thrilling about that. So we're saying End of Dragons. We're saying Canther. Isn't it now time to go somewhere totally new? Zotaka, for all intents and purposes, basically would be entirely new. It kind of fits that bill because it, it didn't appear in Guild Wars 1. It was a scrapped campaign, many elements of which got rolled into Eye of the North, which, you know, wouldn't be rolled into a Guild Wars 2 Zotaker. We already have those set pieces and elements in, in the Asura and in the Destroyers and in various pieces of architecture and stuff. So many ways it would be totally new, but... Is it fully? I mean, maybe they can just be a bit more creative. Uh, so I'm a bit wobbly on Zotaker. Maybe not next expansion after End of Dragons. Maybe the one after that. Then I'll, then I'll be really, really game for it. There's another just weird thing about this setting where because it's kind of a place that exists in the mist, it's like an ephemeral, like disconnected location, that immediately makes me less excited because what I really think we should be following, if we're not following the story of the Elder Dragons then the devs really need to ground this franchise in what's it all about. And I think that it's all about Tyria at that point. It has to be. I mean, to a certain degree, it already is. So it's a story about Tyria, Tyria's struggles, and so on. And then you're going to base an expansion off in the mist somewhere, and it, it, I think it's not going to feel grounded enough. I think we really need to know what we need to be invested in. For what it's worth, let's just talk about that for a second. What is Guild Wars about after the dragons is about Tyria? What is totally unique about this setting? You know, once you remove the dragons, what's unique about this as a fantasy place? I think that's what the writers really need to sit down and look at. They're kind of big mechanisms, like how the mists functions in their fantasy reality that's unique from other fantasy realities people can go and experience and play. What's interesting and compelling about that and then building stories from there and you know i think what they set up with especially when you look at funnily enough some of the lore i really 
really dislike at the moment because it's not properly been embellished. But if you look at like the world versus world law, where it's like there are multiple alternate reality versions of Tyria that are created by the mists and they're fighting against one another. These kinds of weird threads, I think if, if the studio pulled at those, uh, we could get some amazing stuff. But I'm a sucker for alternate realities and the idea of alternate Tyrias and stuff. And there, once we're in a story like that, that's when a Zotaker expansion really works for me, you know. And we start seeing alternate versions of the characters we know and love, uh, different outcomes to big events we did before. A few years ago now, I did a video that literally just suggested what if Glint never wrote the Flame Seeker prophecies? How would that have changed the plot of the first game? And then everything right up until now. So I definitely think there's a lot of potential there. Cope Cope has a message. I'm realizing this is a big law bomb. I'm feeling so law heavy lately. I don't know what it is. Cope Cope, uh, WP. I'm not the most devoted player of Guild Wars 2, despite my history of the series from 06 to today. Damn. You, you joined around when I did, I think. I might have even been like late 06. I don't know. I was definitely there in 06. Uh, but with how much the commander had achieved and us missing a god. What do you think about the commander becoming a divine once the story is done? I mean, they've killed dragons, they've beat a god more than Cormir ever did, unified armies, wiped off graffiti from homes, and even repaired homes. Oh, and they beat Dai, and they even give the dragonborn a run for his money. Uh, okay, so, first of all, we didn't necessarily do more than Cormir did. Let's be clear. The Balthazar we fight in Path of Fire is not, god is not a god-tier entity. He has been broken and ruined and chained up in the mists by the other gods. He's escaped, siphoned some power from Bloodstone Fen, and that's it. Alright, he's got a bit of the energy from one shard of a Bloodstone explosion. That is what we fought. He's not at the same tier as all that other stuff. And if you compare that to Abaddon, Abaddon was still a full god, while still imprisoned and enchained. But the energy that Cormir would have absorbed from him, as far as I can see, would have been way, way, way more. Uh, there is kind of a wriggle there. It's like, why did Balthazar have no magic in his chains or no power left in his chains? While Abaddon did, didn't the gods need a mortal to take that energy? So is there a story right now that we don't know about where there is actually already a replacement? Some of you guys have talked to me about that in the past, uh, which I think is very interesting. And we kind of just missed that a little bit. Maybe that ties into the Lissa story. Can End of Dragons do all of that? I very, very much doubt it. Uh, but okay, so you ask me, what about the commander now becoming a god somehow? If there is space for it on the pantheon or whatever well i don't like it i don't like it because like okay first of all the a good thing that guild wars does is has the commander be a real character that does real things and has actual emphasis on the world so i think that it is a door that's open to guild wars more than say any other mmo i think that's possible but the kind of direction that the story would go in if you are a literal god walking around I think it is is too peculiar, is, is too strange. I mean, what kind of companionship do we feel with other people when the power level is so weird? I think it's a really dangerous, really bad, silly idea. You do say as the when the story is done. So if there was ever a moment, if they're going to Guild Wars 3 and they say, right, this is it. It's the end of dragons, the end of everything. We are a god, it's over. Yeah, I can see that. Um, but it's hard because I don't know whether MMOs ever, modern successful MMOs as Guild Wars 2 is, will ever get a real ending. It's just such a damaging, like, moment for the business. I think the, the continuation of the story is so bound in the play, in the minds of many consumers to the idea of the continuation of the product itself that they can't just say this is the end because then people tune out, you know, and that was a big problem with Eye of the North. And even in Eye of the North, the devs never really had the balls to do something big and special at the end. Any interesting moments that might have occurred for the hero of the first game, you only kind of get glimpses and suggestions about as almost eggs in the sequel. If anyone knows for what it's worth of an example of MMOs that have had proper ends, where they did something interesting with the story at the end, they didn't just quietly close the servers while everyone parties in, in a city or something, the, the devs actually put some extra little thing in there. That would be really, really interesting to me, and I'd love to hear those stories. And one final thing, again, about the idea of becoming a divine. I think this is one of those things where, right now, I would say that the Guild Wars fantasy, Tyria, is kind of distinct as its fantasy without divines. And what do I mean by that? Well, whenever they've ever had a godly figure, they've torn it down. And they said, no, 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 this isn't really a god. It's just a powerful thing 
in this universe and it's so powerful and it's responsible for nurturing x race or whatever so they see it as divine the gods think that they have six divines or whatever but like they're not true gods in terms of like they created everything and they know everything and they are like the grandfathers of creation and and are responsible for all there isn't someone truly looking over the whole world as we know it it is pretty much pure chaos that's generated out of the mist there is kind of an empty spot of a true divine in this universe now a story post end of dragons that properly looks at that and maybe does implement one would be interesting but I wonder whether the devs will always shy away from that kind of thing as well um, and just sort of keep it about the people. Therefore, a story where the commander kind of hits the power level of the six true gods. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean it's going to be more likely to, ha to work in the, in the context of this story or less likely? That's a really interesting idea. But uh, yeah, I do want to point out that's kind of a defining point of, of this fa fantasy, I think. That we have no gods. Not really. Wait until the Zotaker expansion and they reveal the god of time actually rules everything or something. And he lives in the Hall of Heroes in the Rift or, you know, some such idea. Alright, so here's a comment from the Best of Guild Wars video. I put as my number one the implementation of Mounts, this guy. And I applaud his bravery, really. Uh, it says, Mounts is literally the worst thing in the game. The game was clearly designed for no mount, and this is on a video where I put it like number one, and like all the biggest thumbed up co comments with like hundreds of thumbs, they're all people saying, yeah, number one's indisputable, blah, blah. This guy says, mounts are the worst thing. The game was clearly designed for no mounts. Now people just bypass map completion and jump quests with their bunnies and their dragons. Yeah, they do maneuver well, but I feel like it's cheating. I was playing with a friend excited to make him do the jumping puzzles. Arrive at the spot, see a dragon bypass all of it. Friend falls once and then says, oh, fuck it, I'll wait until I have a dragon. And um, so this other guy, Waffling Mean, says, I also feel like the ads add more than they take away. And these days in crucial areas like the jumping puzzles, the devs disable mounts. Uh, as for world completion, you're right. Uh, it does make it way too short. It's hard to enjoy everything. But be honest, Cortier has always struck me as something very bland, aside from a few places. I feel like a traditional questing system with voice acting, combined with dynamic events and hearts, would have really made the world feel more full. Well, that's some coulda, shoulda, woulda, coulda stuff about Core that we really we don't have to get into. Um, what I would say though is when they added mounts to Corteria, they did a pass over a lot of the jumping puzzles, disabling them. But they didn't do that when the sky scale came in. And the sky scale really allows you to get a lot higher and a lot do a lot cleverer things. Also, the bond of faith, the extra jump you get off of the top of the mount, means that you can genuinely cheat a ton of jumping puzzles. Once again, I have to um, recommend that shaman who's actually had some health issues re recently. So if you guys uh, go to his Twitter, go wish him some uh, good health. But he's got a YouTube video series where he shows you how to beat like every single jumping puzzle in seconds. Completely legit methods just using mounts where you just fly to a certain point and then you hit the bond of faith usually is the answer and then you'll land and you'll complete it it's a really fascinating binge worthy uh series but look here's the thing i want to point out with mounts in corteria uh, waffling means saying, oh, they add more than they take away. Look, this is not a compromise we have to make. They don't have to add some and take some. That We can have everything we want. It's simply that the mastery, I've said this a million times, the mastery system should not affect pre-80 characters. It is a post-80 progression system that is immediately enabled on the creation of every new character right now. If the devs just toggled it off when you were level 79 and below, you would once again have a pretty much... Well, as far as co uh, exploration is concerned, combat balance is a different story. But as far as exploration is concerned, intact vanilla experience of Corteria that is not undermined. You would have that fresh character feel. Then once you hit 80, fine, cheese the whole thing if you like. And yeah, there's kind of a thing about world comp and is it too fast now, but... Really, it boils down to a gift of exploration, and new legendaries don't use gifts of exploration. So, you know, maybe, maybe this is something we can hand wave. I know I certainly don't worry about it too much. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, why is this in End of Dragons Daily? It's because if they made that patch, it could be during the End of Dragons era. So it works, guys. Jasper says, would you ever consider doing another fresh play of Guild Wars 1 from the ground up? Oh, I've, uh, my potato is actually covering the word up there. I've been doing that a couple of times recently. Sorry, guys. I, I just need to crop it slightly further over to the right when I take the screenshot. Well, yes and no. As far as videos are concerned, the answer is generally no. 
Uh, I've already done it all, really. Uh, there was just some PvP content that I haven't done. I like the LPs as they're currently on the channel. They're a bit old, but I'm still relatively proud of them. I actually had a message yesterday of someone calling me misogynistic, timestamping a specific moment in a, like a 10-year-old Nightfall video, which, which was fun. But in general, I like them. That said, there are two projects. One is Winds of Change. I would really like to do a Winds of Change playthrough for you guys. Ideally right after they announce something with End of Dragons, so I'm sure we'll be waiting another month for this stream um, But around then that might be really really well timed and the other thing I've, I've always said is if there ever came a moment where I decided Really that's it. I'm done with Guild Wars. I'm, I'm done with all of this. It's over. I'm out uh, I would probably make the last project I ever did be a pre searing series because I never really did that um, If you go back and you watch my prophecies LP these were some of the first videos I ever made uh, the ones I made before that were like PvP videos with copyrighted music and stuff and they're generally unlisted. But um, if you watch my prophecy stuff, I go through pre-searing in like 9 or 12 episodes or something. Which might sound like a lot, but it's actually a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. And I gloss over a huge amount of the content in pre. And the reason I did that was because right as I made my LP, I looked at what other people were doing with the Guild Wars and there was basically no one around. But any LP, like, they were either, like, skipping through the game at a ludicrous speed, not focusing on any anything, or th there was, like, a 44-episode series of a guy in pre-searing, and he hardly spoke. Each video was, like, 10 minutes long, which was the limit at that time, and he hardly said a thing in every episode. It was just wandering around pre and I thought oh god it ca uh, mine can't be that long so I tried to like rush through basically and it means that there's a lot of content that I haven't shown off so pre and winds of change privately I've really wanted to go back and do a playthrough with my girlfriend but she refuses I guess the game looks too old you know, I'm not sure whether I'm an advocate of like a, a big Guild Wars 1 remaster initiative, but it does seem true that there's a lot of newer players in this franchise now that never played the first and they just won't go back unless something like that happens. So, hey, who knows? Two more, and I'll have to be quick with these. Maverick says, In one week, I managed to discover all the End of Dragons daily. Watch them all. It's been a great week, and I think my own mental health has never been better because of it. I'm so excited about the endless potential End of Dragons has. Well, you got to be careful. I mean, 90% of the stuff we talk about here and people want here might not happen, right? Like, we spend a lot of time talking about the idea that the Tengu might be a playable race. Uh, do steal yourself, guys. It's just because it's said. Yeah, you never know what we'll really get. Uh, for some pu future potential video idea, what if we did get Tengu, but gl by gliding and flying mounts were disabled, but instead as a Tengu you had the inherent ability to fly, like actually properly fly. Right, in the past, I would have said true flying is a bad idea and the devs shouldn't do it. And I think they've known that it's a bad idea. That's why the Griffin wasn't a true flyer. That's why the, the sky scale is power crept on the movement and stuff as it is kind of isn't a true flyer. I mean, it's pretty... The sky scale really got damn breaks the game. There's a lot of issues, honestly, long term with the game if you think about the sky scale and how narrow it is to acquire and how much movement it gives you. I think the devs are going to have to do something dramatic there. Um, but it's still not a true flyer. So historically, I would have always said no. However, if you really think about it, going forwards, if they make maps that are made as flyer maps... And it's like, okay, while you're here, it's toggled on. While you're away, it's not. Similar to how in Bloodstone Fen, you can have combat while gliding, but in none of the other maps, you can. Right? Maybe in this one map, you can fly a lot better. I can kind of see it working, you know? Um, if you think of some of those Heart of Thorns experiences, like you're really high up in Verdant Brink, you're hitting all those updrafts and stuff and ley lines, you're kind of flying on a glider. Um, the idea of locking it to just one race, though, that's going to be a big no-no. That's against the fundamentals of this game's philosophy. I think if you see the studio do that, that will be a, a, a true sign that we have a new crew of devs. You know, there's been a lot of, of employee ch uh, churn and, and people really have a new vision at this point. And that we're kind of breaking away from Guild Wars once was. I don't think it's a very good idea. Or at least maybe it should be you unlock it by default as a Tengu and then later... You can unlock it on the other characters. But, I mean, listen to what this conversation has become, guys. What, what we're going to be a flying char, are we? What, we're going to give magic riding brooms to everyone? Or we're just going to upgrade gliders to be able to all flap or something? I'm just, I'm not buying it, really. Uh, so, sorry.
And finally, the last comment here from Giovaz89, who says, Hey WP, I'm curious, what do you think about a possible delivery of travel to Cantha? Independently of the means of travel, do you think we'll get only a cinematic? Or could it be possible to have a real dangerous field travel experience like the airship part of Victory or Death? I was thinking, in case of a ship, having it behaving like a map would be fun. A heart for ship tasks, dynamic events to repel dangers, and a final cinematic in story mode. So afterwards, you can choose to pay a lot to travel via waypoint, or travel by ship again or do you think any of this makes sense or does this see something like this well I don't think they need to do a travel system beyond waypoints just because the waypoints will be expensive if you're going from the very top of Grothmar to the very bottom of the Akavald forest for example or something that's gonna be a, a high waypoint price but you got to remember that waypoint prices are unbelievably cheap and drifted out of uh, respect of the rest of the economy at this point so in a way I actually view that as in reinstating meaningful waypoint costs I kind of actually like that I wouldn't bypass waypoints and I, I think it would just be a bit clumsy and unnecessary however this idea of a map where we're actually on our way there I really love and I think it actually offers something that Guild Wars 2 has always failed at I mean genuinely always failed at but the first game didn't with its campaign approach that's a sense of an adventure where we have a point A, we're at point A and we're going to point B and we know that it's far away and we're traveling through a lot of terrain and geography. They just have never done that. They did it a little bit maybe in 2012 with the knowing that ore was off way down south. But the way that the personal story was structured, it didn't really feel like we went on an adventure to ore. It felt like we just kind of accidentally wound up at the Straits of Devastation and then there was one D-Day thing and we were there. Um, and then you look at every expansion. They're kind of meandering expansions. It's not like when we started POF, we always knew we were on our way to Vabi. No, we kind of meandered our way to Vabi. It's not like in uh, Heart of Thorns, we knew that we were going to be on the coast. That was the, the place where Mordremoth had to die or whatever we just kind of wandered around and found ourselves there in living world they only ever really get to add one map at a time and the only map i think that and this might be why it was so high on my top of guild wars 2 list that kind of gave me a sense of progression was probably bitter frost frontier where we kind of knew we were going to go to that really really snowy icy dangerous place but we had to travel around to get the elixir i might even be remembering that kind of poorly so the idea that when the canther expansion comes out we're not immediately dumped in there because of travel on an airship but we actually get an intermediary map where we spend a good amount of time and maybe it looks like there's a boat on there or something i don't know we could see what they do that's really fun to me and i think that would create a sense of the adventure that i've been looking for well, there you have it, guys. That's End of Dragons Daily 81. Please feel free to drop any comments and thoughts and responses down below. I'll get to as many of them as I can on the very next part. Also, keep your eye out. The very next video on the channel is going to be End of Dragons related as well. It's picking up a series that I started with the announcement of the X-Pack last year and then kind of put on hi hiatus when I realized I was doing it way too early. But I think around about now is a good time to bring it back. It's heavy about the lore. It's heavy about End of Dragons. You could probably guess what it is. Hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.